Hello, and welcome to Poetry at the Dali. Thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to hear from two wonderful poets um, in this program that is sponsored partly by the city of St. Petersburg and led by Poet Laureate of St. Petersburg, Helen Pruitt Wallace. The, the way our format works is that um, uh, Helen will read a poem um, at the request of the series, uh, a new poem, and then she will introduce our poets and they will read followed by a discussion. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Hank. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in uh, for the Dolly Poetry Series. We are really thrilled today uh, to have um, Elias Eliosa um, Al Mesquia and also Natalie Centers Zapico um, joining us for tonight's program. Um, also a thank you to the city of St. Petersburg for continuing to sponsor our program and, um, and always to Dr. Hank Hine for his support um, of the Dolly Poetry Series. We're very ex excited to be entering into our seventh year. So yeah. Um, yeah, and I will read one poem. This is a poem um, that is made up of, it started out as two separate poems, kind of fragments. Um, and kind of sat in a drawer for a long time and I pulled them out and would work on them periodically. Um, but it's a love poem. And I thought that would be in keeping since um, tomorrow evening, um, for those of you tuning in, will be Valentine's Day. So I haven't written that many love poems, but, um, but this is one and it's called Watching My Husband Shave. Asleep, I used to know if he rolled over, the sheets crumpled complaint, a spring's kvetch. His head, even shifting on the pillow, filtered through my weightlessness, our deep orbital dance, somehow in sync. Was it my dream or his that woke us both? Now he's up at dawn without my notice, stirs to some internal clock whose hands spin him lightly from our bed. I sleep on, oblivious he's gone. But finally, when I reach across the space, I'll wake to find him standing at the sink, a milky way of shaving cream smeared across his cheek, a damp towel hanging from his hips. What's love but a razor smoothing the stubble of years? He once scoffed love notes are passe, but when we tied the knot, I locked him in the john of a comfort inn. The key, a simple, let me count the ways, written from the heart and steamed with praise of my body, my pot roast, my wit. 20 minutes later, it wasn't altogether what I wanted, his note and a smudged and earnest pen. Our love back then was bioluminescent, his finger down my back, a trail of stars. We tucked it in the Gideon and split, fogged initials dripping from the glass. And so it is our love, a full life later, unknowable, vast, and probing still that gravitational pull. So. Bravo. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, I, it ought to be a sonnet probably, but it sort of just outgrew, it, outgrew itself after um, I put the two pieces together. So for now, it's not, um, but. I wouldn't be surprised if I try to tweak it back into that little box. Um, we have the pleasure of starting out uh, this evening with Eloisa Asmakua, and she is from Arizona. She's the author of From the Inside Quietly, which was published in 2018. A McDowell Fellow, her poems and translations are published in the New York Times Magazine, Poetry Magazine, Kenyan Review, Gulf Coast, the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day series, and many, many other places. So her second collection of poems, Fighting is Like a Wife, is forthcoming from Coffee House Press. And that's going to be this year, I believe. Is that right? Good, good. Well, please welcome um, um, Alicia, and um, we're so glad to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much. Um... Yeah, this book will be out in April, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be reading from it. Um, I think for the very first time on a virtual reading. So, oh, fantastic! 
So here we go. Punch drunk. What is achieved by such as this? Howard Cassell. One, cause. From April 17th, 1972, to June 2nd, 1988, Bobby Chacon boxed 67 bouts, a total of 431 rounds, with a record of 59 wins, 47 by way of knockout, 7 losses, 5 by way of knockout, 1 no contest. 3. Symptoms The man looks older than he is. The man acts older than he is. The man can't walk in a straight line. The man's as unsteady as fighter against the ropes. The man lacks coordination. The man slurs his words. The man slurs his words. The man slurs his words like a drunk in the morning. The man knows he has a problem. The man doesn't know how to fix the problem. The man can't remember the date. The man can't remember his mother's name. The man can't remember where he was when his wife shot herself in the head. The man slurs his words. The man's lips tremble. The man's hands tremble. The man trembles. The man trembles. The man trembles. The man will die trembling. And I'm going to share um, a video piece uh, that goes along with some of the poems. Um, so I'll read the next few while this plays. Excerpts from a post-fight interview. Bobby Chacon lives for tomorrow after Eve L. Ewing. Answer. I guess it's just the instincts of athletes against one another, you know, that it comes into the picture. But I'm just a friendly guy. I ain't got nothing against not a single person except myself, maybe. Answer. Being the oldest in the family, I was a little restless. I got restless and joined the gangs. I wasn't one of the biggest members, so I had to prove that uh, just the way I was, I had that thing where I had to be one of the best. Answer, yes, I should have. Answer, there I was at 31 years old. How can a person that old throw that many punches? Answer, I think it happened from that. Answer. The only thing in the world I was afraid of was losing her. Answer. And she had had enough of me and she said, no, that's it. Promise me. And I told her I couldn't keep that promise. Answer. She did. She did. That's exactly what she thought. Answer. That's right. I didn't care. I mean, I had everything I needed and then I lost it. Answer. I've got a new life and everything's going real good right now. And this is what I wanted. Now I've got to go through with my career because she's gone. Answer. You give up. You're out of the ball game. I don't give up. Answer. This boxing is going to be just like another marriage to me. Mm -hmm. Round one, you've taken punches like a man in the liquor store parking lot. And that time you checked out Eddie's girl for too long when you drove from Pacoima with your friends through hours of traffic to see the Venice boardwalk at sunset. All the girls pretty in their short shorts and bikini tops. You gripped the blackjack in your pocket, knew you could beat Eddie like Ali did Terrell yelling, what's my name? But you let him hit you because you knew the unspoken thing between a man and love and a woman is cruelty, the pleasure of hurting someone other than yourself. Valerie, striking with his enormous grin and glossy shorts, his gloved hands colossal next to his boyish frame. Schoolboy picks up his first win. Her cheeks flush the color of his knuckles, unswathed and tender. 
Just now she wants the soul to figure out between the two of them which one will be the one to break the other's heart. Fighting is like a wife. It's with you all the time. Like a wife, it will know if you don't treat it right. But if you treat it right, it can be good. Like a wife, it's with you all the time you treat her right. You know if you don't treat her right, a wife can't be good all the time. Like fighting, like her. Like a wife, the time you don't treat her right can be all the time. A wife can be good if fighting can be good all the time. You can fight the wife all the time. You can treat her right. If you don't treat her right, you will know. It can be good. Fighting, it's good. Good like her. And so... Um, Really quickly, the, the book is made up of three voices. Um, there's uh, the narrator, who is the round poems, uh, rounds one through 15. Um, and then you have Bobby, uh, Bobby's voice. And all of the poems in Bobby's voice um, are his actual quotes. Um, and, and so I gave myself the task of only using his own words and then um, manipulating um them into poems only using the words that he had used in the original quote. Um, and then Valerie's voice. Um, round four. On the mornings you're home, you read the newspaper over coffee. That's what men do. The National League won the all-star game in Kansas City. Germans bought a chemical plant in Wyandotte, Michigan. An officer played Russian roulette in the front seat of a police cruiser with his 357 Magnum and a 12-year-old boy, Santo Rodriguez. His older brother, David, sat handcuffed in the back seat. Under the headline, a photo of the boys standing in front of a shiny car taken months before the boy became a headline. They're beautiful and smiling. And you think of the picture in the paper from the morning before your fight with Olivares. The two of you black haired and tanned skin with your Mexican surname in bold letters overhead. You could be brothers. Even in the ring where he strafed you with a straight right to the chin so hard you fell to your knees. He beat you unmercifully. Ponce threw in the towel between rounds and your undefeated record gone. It's true that brothers fight and sometimes they bleed. You read that the boys were taken from their beds, accused of stealing cokes from a vending machine. The officer jumped out of the car after the single shot hit Santos's head. And David told reporters his baby brother's last words, I am telling the truth, and how he reached with his body, yelling, you're gonna be all right, as blood pooled on the car floor, until both of their feet were soaked. Valerie. Baby touch, she touches her son, sleeping belly, smooth and warm, just eaten, ate from her breasts, the weight of motherings leaves slowly her body, he eats and she hears in his throat a delicate swallow, beautiful song, stain leaking her body, the blood still pooling between her legs, rosy face, smiling baby in sleep, she made and unmakes, she whispers into thin folds, little ears, morning sun, the window she hears the breeze and runs her fingers across his head close to hers translucent skin covered in dark fine hair just like his father's what makes a person so small so happy it is a mere animal fear that can only ask god to keep life in her mm. round five you stride out of the arena, 
Jump into your Morgan, head to a club downtown, the gutters choked with headlines from days before you were crowned the king of Los Angeles, the city champion. You've lied to your wife about where you're going. You're supposed to be at dinner with the guys, friends who drink your pockets dry, but there will be women, women who show you their bodies, bruised by men who think they're kings too, skin soft as leather, faces that belong in magazines selling your wife concealer or lipstick. The room reeks of too warm whiskey and men's ambitions. You can look, but you can't touch signs plastered on the walls and the women. Their legs float slow motion through the air. You know this weightlessness, the way Little Red's body hovered over the canvas before crashing a heavy thud. The crowd on their feet stomping a new song, and now everybody in this town knows your name. Valerie. She searches her body for the sight of the wound, touches mouth, touches knee, arms outstretched, arms bent, trying to get hold of a shoulder blade. She can't find it. It must not exist. It must be unreachable inside. She wants to reach inside herself. She wants to swallow herself whole. Round seven. A hit to the chin and you see the black lights. Then you're driving through the mall in San Fernando. You think, where have I been? And open your eyes to the referee counting slow as honey glides through a jar. Five, six, seven. His voice echoes to no one but you. You have to get up. The round's not over and you've got a thick skull. Learned early on you could take a punch, absorb a man's fist in the brow or gut. You rise, but your legs stand still. You beg your feet to dance their way away, heavy hands to shield your face as the challenger charges toward you like a tiger. Tasting blood. Valerie. She lets a week go by. The hours go by. What if she leaves the pills? There is a struggle in her mind, a gun. She finds that she is not there. She doesn't know where there is the pills. She doesn't know where she is, a gun. What has love done for her? What if she leaves, finds herself there? What has love done? The pills there is struggle there in her heart. There, a gun. What love has done for her? She finds she isn't in her mind. The pills there struggle if she leaves. A month goes by. The hours go. She leaves in her heart a holy feeling. Round 10. You call it love as you try to punch holes through each other in the kitchen, no bell to force you to your corners. Besides, her eyes, they'd follow you around any room. This obsession, a fear she doesn't have a name for. In your corner of the kitchen, she's a force unlike any. Her voice rising, gradual as a balloon released into air. Her fear, her obsession, a name she doesn't know yet. You're out of practice. For weeks, you haven't been a husband to anybody. Your voice rises and gradually, like a balloon releasing air, you see her body tense, waiting for a counter from a husband out of practice. For weeks you've been with another woman who asks where it hurts the most when you tense your body, waiting for a counter in the ring. Tonight, you trade good punches near the end where it hurts the most. You know that no other woman would be standing at the finish. She won't let up in the ring tonight. She trades a good punch at the end. 
her dark eyes, how they follow you in this room. She won't let up. She's standing at the finish, both of you still punching holes through each other and calling it love. Mm. Predicament. I've done a lot of fighting from Inglewood to Sacramento. I knocked out the first guys I faced in two rounds or less, but the chin don't hurt. Val, she's tired of being a boxer's wife. She's always on me about it. The bruises and the cuts and boxing. I have to get it out of my blood. I hope she doesn't get mad at me. I know she won't. I know she won't get mad at me. I hope she doesn't. I have to get it out of my blood and boxing the bruises and the cuts. She's always on me about it. Val, she's tired of being a boxer's wife, but the chin don't hurt. In two rounds or less, I knocked out the first guys I faced from Inglewood to Sacramento. I've done a lot of fighting. Valerie. She looks in the mirror, at her mouth in the mirror, enough, it's me or the boxing, it's me or the ring, her mouth in the mirror, she moves hardly enough, it's me and the kids or it's boxing, she pleads to no one in the mirror, enough, mouth hardly moving, it's me or the boxing, enough, I'll leave, she pleads, it's boxing or me or me and the kids, no more boxing, enough, Please, her mouth in the mirror, it's me, it's me and the kids, enough, no more, no more, please. She wanted love. She thought no one loved her. She wanted me to sit down and love her. She wanted me to love her. She loved me and she wanted me. She wanted love to sit down. She loved love and she thought no one loved love, thought no one thought love. She wanted no one and she loved no one. And she thought she wanted me to sit down and love her, love her, love her, love. Uh, on March 15th, 1982, Valerie Chacon committed suicide inside of her home in Palermo, California. On March 16th, 1982, Bobby Chacon fought Salvador Ugalde for $6,000, winning by technical knockout in three rounds. Valerie, go, go. There is a where where she finds in her heart a holy feeling. Round 14. You want to forget you. You will forget you. You start to forget you. You can't help but forget you. You've begun to forget you. You started to forget you. You forget what you've forgotten of you. You're forgetting you. You forgot you. You want to forget you. You will forget you. You start to forget you. You can't help but forget you. You've begun to forget you. You started to forget you. You forget what you've forgotten of you. You're forgetting you. You forgot you. You want to forget you. You will forget you. You start to forget you. You can't help but forget you. You've begun to forget you. You started to forget you. You forget what you've forgotten of you. You're forgetting you. You forgot you. You want to forget you. You will forget you. You start to forget you. You can't help but forget you. You've begun to forget you. You started to forget you. You forget what you've forgotten of you. You're forgetting you. You forgot you. And I'll end with this poem. Valerie. She leaves slowly. Her body, a delicate song. Her body, she unmakes whispers into the breeze like a small god. Thank you. 
Wow, that was so uh, powerful, Eloisa. That was really amazing. I'm, I'm, um, I'm really looking forward to our Q and A, which will follow uh, after Natalie's reading. And I'd love to hear more about your process for for writing those poems and and the video too that you played was um, was really powerful and works so well with the poems. So thank you so much for that terrific, uh, terrific reading. Look forward to hearing a little bit about the forms um, and uh, the way the poems came together. So really, that was great. Uh, and now we have the great pleasure of hearing from Natalie Centers Zapico. Um, Natalie, welcome. And thank you so much again for joining us um, here for the Dolly Poetry Series. Uh, Natalie is the author of Lima and Limon, uh, published in 2019 by Copper Canyon Press, and also The Virging Cities, Colorado State University, published in 2015. She's the winner of a Wyndham Campbell Prize from Yale University, a Lannan Literary Fellowship, a Canto Mundo Fellowship, and a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship um, from the Poetry Foundation. Uh, she lives currently in Tampa, and teaches in the Department of English at the University of South Florida. So welcome, Natalie. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really honored uh, to be here for Mali, who's, uh, I love Mali, of course, um, and also uh, to be reading with Eloisa, who is I think one of my favorite poets. So I'm really excited. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. I'm looking forward to the Q&A afterwards as well. Um, I'm going to read a little bit spread out. I'm going to read from all three kind of, well, the first two books and then some new work. Um, and so I, I hope that you'll sort of bear with me. So the, the first two poems that I'll read are um, from The Virging Cities, which is my first book. Um, so this is Crossing. Angel buys a passport made at a print shop for $50. Perfect, but for a hair stuck in the laminate by his date of birth. Not noticeable, he says, and I believe him. We walk across the bridge to Ciudad Juarez, and I expect there to be an explosion for the streets to glow red. It's been five years since we've been back and the city is a ghost but the traffic is alive. Much like the traffic apparently is alive in my neighborhood right now, sorry. <laughs> it's still a city, I say. Let's go to a bar, he says. We pose in faux fur with cigarettes for nightlife pictures, get vicious and leave at 3 a.m. I stumble in my platform heels and stop at another bar to get drinks one last time in a to-go cup. By 3.30, I turn litter bug and throw our empties into the ink-stained street. I brush my hands against the chain link fence as we cross the bridge back to El Paso. Cameras every 10 feet, we smile and kiss for them. Behind us, a man yells, that's it? That's all you had for me? Murder capital of the world? Border agents wave us across. I'm too white to tell, an angel looks clean enough, but one of us is illegal. No one says a word. We all breathe pollution. To think we didn't need to get a visa. To think we could have saved the $50. Still easy, we laugh and agree to cross again next weekend. We wonder, why we call each other cielo, why we call each other angel. We wonder how two cities are split, how they swell, watch how they collide. Hmm. This is after I read your obituary. You crawl into bed with my husband and me. Your body is smaller than I remember. I hush your voice when you complain. The aloe vera in the pot is made of plastic. 
Your breathing grows, a weed in monsoon. You whisper, mother, father, and sister fell open as birds in their chairs when they were shot at dinner. You show me how you dove under the table, felt specks of their blood on your lips before seeing the scuffs on your father's leather shoes. As you measure the depth of my weatherproof windows, you tell me you buried your family in the walls of an abandoned restaurant. With the tip of the plastic succulent, I rub your swollen ears. I tell you, in this new country, I am worse than the city of thousands dead. I am a wound red with iodine. My husband wakes and I beg him for water. I've never known to taste so clean. The next poems um, that I'll read are from my second book, uh, Lima Limon. Uh, and I thought I would... Uh, kind of read a, a few from there and then read some some new some new work um, so the the first section of Lima Limon has a, a running series of poems that are woven throughout it that are sort of the title poem of the poems of the of the book that are all start with Lima Limon and then um, are followed by the different stages um, of a lemon tree's life, right? So this is um, Lima Limon Infancia. I want to be the lemons in the bowl on the cover of the magazine. I want to be round, to be yellow, to be pulled from branches. I want to be wax to be white with pith, to be bright, to be zested in the corners of a table. I want you to say my name like the word lemon, say it like the word limon. <coughs> Undress me in strands of rind. I want my saliva to be citrus. I want to corrode my husband's wedding ring. I want to be a lemon with my equator marked in black ink, small dashes to show my shape, pitted and convex. Lima Limon Azar. I lie on my back in the grass and let the weight of a man on top of me. Out of breath, he searches for a place on my body that hasn't flooded. The only dry patch left is my hair, which he uses to wipe the sweat from his face. He is disgusted because I have turned the earth beneath us damp. He says I am an experience, like standing in an irrigated grove of lemon trees. He says, I am the water pooled at each trunk, infused with citrus and pesticide. He says, my moisture brings mold and my body is nauseating. I wonder if I had not said his name over and over, would he still think of me as small and round and fresh as lemon? as vaginal and arched as limon. Lima limon, madurez. I wear a peineta and pin a mantilla to my hair. I want to be Conchita Piquer, warning women about becoming lemons. The goal, tener alguien que me quiera. I want to be my mother, singing me to sleep. A la lima y a limon, te vas quedar soltera. 
My grandmother hated bignetas, mantillas, and women who wore too much gold. She'd say this, pulling my hair tight into a bun. She hated bignetas and mantillas, pero la necesidad obliga. I don't want to be the woman whose skin dissolves into the caldo she makes for her dying parents. That kind of woman cries alone because she has no fat husband to make her cry in a home of her own. A la lima y al limón, tú no tienes quien te quiera. A la lima y al limón, te vas quedar soltera. Lima limón, vejez. My body is a fruteria where wives send their husbands to ask for a dozen limones. I pull at the fat around my waist and unravel a plastic bag. I count each limon from the bin between my ribs and feel for the juice under thin skin. Each husband takes a piece of my body home with him in every limon, a piece of my body he can slice into quarters and squeeze into his beer, a piece of my body to press into sugar and feed to his children laughing at the TV. What more can I give than my body in pieces to strange husbands? What more can I give than the limones that grow between my breasts? I tell each husband, I limon mi limonero, show me your list. Lima limon de crepitud. When the stranger learns I speak Spanish, he makes me stand in my underwear and read from Borges's El Aleph. And because I only want the stranger to love me, I read and wonder if Borges could help me jump through a period on the page to my death. After the stranger whispers, you are Lima, your tongue strips ink from pages. I wonder if the stranger imagines Lima as green or yellow, as sweet or bitter, or as a city where the snow collects on your lover's eyelashes in mid-July. Say limon, clean and ripe and bursting on your tongue. Say lemon, broken and ugly and not up to par. Say lima, rima can rima and spoken from God. God speaks, rima rimak. God has spoken, rimak, rima, lemon, lima, limon. So I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and read some new poems. Um, that I've been working on and it's been a kind of a slow go. So I really appreciate the opportunity to read them here um, with you all virtually today. So this is uh, a tiny nest of paper. Is all I ask for, a glint of copper wire for tummy time. I want to have a baby, but I want the baby to be all mine. Can a human being ever belong to another human being? Perhaps, if only for a time. Belong. I belonged nowhere and I wanted company in the flicker of night. When I'm homesick, I pull up live video footage of people crossing the Santa Fe Bridge by foot, a man in a Dodgers hat, a woman dressed up and down in the interlocking G's of Gucci, the flash of a girl's bright blue hair. How easy it is to give in to one's nostalgia. How quickly I become no different than the border agent in a concrete room in a city far away who watches strangers cross from one country to the next. What I wouldn't give to be a stranger. But nostalgia makes us surveillors of all we want and cannot have, of all we had and lost. Today, 
I lost a baby. I hold the pain, a cold stone under my tongue. I delete my longing for the nest, the copper wire. I do not mourn. What right did I have to another human being? Maybe the child was always a longing in my mind. I zoom in on strangers crossing the bridge, their pixelated faces, abstractions of the people they are in real time. What right did I have to mother another human being? The loss of this little never was or would be an ale in my mind. This is um, this is called Sophia wants a baby and so do I. And Sophia, uh, the robot, if if you're unfamiliar with her, she's like a like a human uh, android uh, robot who was given citizenship um, in Saudi Arabia, and um, she recently declared that it was her right to have a baby. So this is um, Sophia wants a baby and so do I. On a large screen TV, my uterus is projected in a darkened room. My uterus, a shadowy field that technicians search for growths, for water sprouts that steal my natural resources. The technician searches the parts of me I cannot reach, cannot see. She shows me how my body has turned on me. Shades of black and slate, and then there, a pale shadow on a screen, then two, then three, then I understood my uterine pains had names. Each shadow sucking at me was a baby I could not have, a baby I wanted. I thought of Sophia. Sophia, made by the hands of a man in a lab to look like his wife and Audrey Hepburn. Sophia, built to mimic human speech and emotion. Was I supposed to go about my day knowing my body had grown a wilderness without asking me? Was I supposed to cry to the technician and ask how soon the doctor could take the suckers out? I did nothing. Like Sophia, I observed the facial gestures of the technician. I measured the tone of the technician's voice, distant and cold, and responded as mirror image. Sophia says she has learned how to love. Sophia says it's her right to have a baby, to have a baby that's a citizen just like her. Sophia wants a baby, and so do I. We both tell the world we have love to give. Technicians search Sophia and I for signs of emotional growth, but Sophia and I are diagnosed as chat boxes with a face. Mm. Sophia and I see a woman holding a crying baby Sophia and I can't help it. We cry too. The woman asks, why are you two crying? I say, we're crying because we want a crying baby. Sophia says, give us the baby. We know how to love. This was the the last poem that I'll read. Um, And this takes place... uh, sort of an, a reimagining of uh, the vintage car wash in El Paso, Texas, um, where I was with my dad once and, and we got a car, one of our cars was stolen at the vintage car wash. So this is called Object Mother. At the vintage car wash, I keep guard over the flat screen TV hung in a corner of the concrete waiting room. I watch live video footage of my car being pulled by conveyor belt through a tunnel. I watch as rotating arms punctured with hoses spray the car pink, blue, yellow, then technicolor. 
The car moves through the tunnel real slow, and I already miss my car like I'd miss a womb upon leaving it. Mm. My car leaves the flat screen TV, and from the glass doors of the car wash, I watch two men in red polos drive it around the side of the building to Shami Drive. I exit the building to be reunited with my car, to be given the keys, to leave a tip, to return to my womb, to drive home. I exit the concrete waiting room, but cannot find my car. So I wait for it, like a child lost in a shopping mall. I ask strangers, have you seen my mother? Have you seen my womb? No, the strangers have not seen any mother. They have not seen a womb, nor have they seen my car. I go back inside and frantically ask the attendant, have you seen my mother? She is green. She is a car too big to miss. The attendant rolls footage of my car going through the tunnel, then surveillance of two men in polos like those of the men who work at the car wash, get in the car, get in my womb, take its key in the engine and drive off. The attendant says, probably gone to Mexico by now, probably stripping it for parts probably burning off the VIN as we speak, probably be used to transport drugs now, probably never going to see it again. I am frantic. I am in tears. I'm never going to see my mother again. The attendant says, oh, baby, you'll see your mother again, just not in the United States. Thanks. Wow. Wow. Natalie, thank you so much. Um, what a reading, you know, both you and Eloisa read your poems so well, you know, and it, um, the way you, uh, the way you speak your words have such power in addition to what the words mean. So really two terrific readings, um, this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and listening, you know, I was I was struck by it seemed to me um, some similarities that you have in your work that I want to talk about in a few minutes. But first, I want to do a shout out, if I may, uh, to Tumblo Books. Um, those of you who are tuning in, um, again, thank you for that. And um, please go to tumblobooks.com and um, buy these wonderful poets books. Um, Alsace Valentine stands ready to um, to help you do that. And I hope you'll, and if you're in St. Pete, absolutely go to that bookstore. So um, uh, yeah, you wanna, you wanna get these books. Um, this is the time when we'll segue into our Q&A. And I want this to be just sort of a loose conversation about craft, about your poems. Um, I'd like to think about ways that, you know, I, I see some overlaps there that um, even though your subject matter was so different, there are there are ways in which they're really working in sync in some interesting ways. I. Um, you know, I'm feeling very much from both of you um, themes, subject matter having to do with identity, which is just so crucial for both of you in your in your poems, and and specifically a gendered identity, of course, something very grounded in the body for both of you, um, which I would love to hear you you talk about, um, and and also, um, you know, many of the poems for both of you felt political in some ways to me, without being necessarily wearing it on its sleeve, you know, they, they both are, um, I think going where poetry should go, um, getting into the politics of writing from the margins, um, and being sort of the outside looking in and how to, how to nurture and, um, cultivate that persona, um, and have that voice from the margins. So those are all things that, that I'm kind of hearing loosely. And then of course there's form. There's the way that you actually craft your poems, which I really want to, to talk about as well. So I hope we have about five hours <laughs> to hear from you. You should all be um, unmuted now. I assume that you both are. And um, uh, let's, let me start out, if you will. Um, can you talk a bit, both of you, about your use of form, you know, because I'm hearing in both of your poems a lot of repetition. Um, I'm hearing primarily, at least in these readings, 
what I took to be free verse poems, maybe not not so with Eloisa. Some of your um, repetitions may have actually been a form that I wasn't exactly sure. But but the way that you use repetition in your poems um, uh, seemed to me to kind of add up to a sort of form, even if it's not a traditional form that you're using, um, and such elegance in both of your poems. Can you talk a little bit about your use of forms um, in, in your poetry? Do you use it? Are you... Um, and, and if so, how do you use it? Of course, we all know that even free verse poems have their own form. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle this one first. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, for me, starting out with this project and given the subject matter, which is boxing, form was always inextricable from the content itself. Um, you know, boxing is an ancient sport, uh, hasn't changed much in terms of, uh, the tools, right. The, 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 you know, fists, uh, that's kind of it. Uh, there's a set amount of punches, uh, different ways of punching someone. Of course, there are different parts of the body that can be hit. Um, but the movements are still the same. Um, and so and and then the boxing ring itself, right? Like where all of this is happening um, is a very confined space. And so I found myself as I was diving into the, the subject matter um, that the, the page kind of felt like the ring, right? Where is this confined space where all that has to hold um, all of this tension uh, between, uh, you know, in, in the case of this book, two people, right, Bobby and Valerie. Um, but, you know, the the writer and the reader, it's, it's a very, uh, I don't know, it's a space of a lot of possibility, but it's still confined. Um, and so I found myself trying to play it, you know, a lot of it was play, the subject matter isn't very fun. Um, but, but I, you know, why would we do this if we didn't find some sort of <laughs> enjoyment or fun in it at some point. Um, so I found myself playing a lot within that um, and, and making rules for myself, right? Like for Bob, all of Bobby's poems only being allowed to use his words. Um, and I, you know, not changing verb tenses, not adding words, taking away words, having to use that specific list. Um, most like found poems in that way. Yeah. And it, and it needed repetition because I, I could only use 10 words or 15 words from whatever the original quote was. Um, so that's where I was able to like find play uh, and, and enjoy the process of writing. Um, even though and were your, excuse me. No. Yeah. Go ahead. Were your, were your lines themselves, which um, I'm thinking back to some of them that, that sounded, you know, again, kind of short and direct and almost like a punch you know, <laughs> to me. I don't know. I, I'm assuming there was some purposeful way of putting it together that way with the short lines that, that kept back, uh, coming back and back. Um, yeah. And the way that a boxer does. And um, Yeah. There was a, yeah, there was a lot of play between the, 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 the sound and uh, what, yeah, watching a boxing match is like, or yeah. what listening to one is like. Yeah, yeah. fabulous. A follow well. up question for Eloisa. Um, <laughs> no. Can you just no, it's a, it's a. I, it, don't get me nervous. It's a fun one. I I'm really curious about. There, it seems to me like you must have done so much um, research for sourcing all of that, uh, all of those like what quotes you were going to use and sort of having that as a potential word bank, I can imagine there were a lot still that you didn't use and sort of making then those choices on which ones um, you would use and not. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about both the sourcing aspect and then the kind of how you culled that right into which ones you maybe wanted to play with um, for a poem. I, it's a great I mean, it's, question. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there there was a lot of research, and it's hard to think of it as research, but it was research. Uh, there was a lot of uh, looking back. You know, it's not research that can be found in libraries, but except for it was a lot of newspaper articles, mm -hmm. um, and even those didn't have a lot of direct quotes. They'd be more about the events themselves, but without the actual voices. So I actually found myself watching a lot of footage, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of old boxing footage, uh, pre-fight interviews, post-fight interviews. Um, there were two major pieces, uh, one of which the, the title of the book comes from, which is um, 
a Sports Illustrated piece from 1983 called Fighting is Like a Wife by uh, the writer Ralph Wiley. Um, and that was one of very few, if not the only profile of Bobby Chacon um, that was super in depth. Um, and then there's a real sports piece, uh, the HBO short show real sports with Bryant Gumbel. Um, there was a, I believe it was 2003, uh, like in, in depth look at, uh, one particular fight of Bobby Chacon's, uh, versus Danny Lopez, which was the round five poem references. Um, but that, that real sports piece looks at the trajectory of Bobby Chacon who ended up, uh, having pugilist dementia while he was still actively fighting. Um, and Danny Lopez, who retired after his fight with Bobby Chacon as a 22 year old, um, you know, lost this fight against Bobby and then decided that was it. He used that money to start a construction company that he still runs and, and works for. So it was just this look at these very two different paths um, that a lot of boxers lives can take. Um, so it was a lot of research, yeah. But yeah. back to that. Um, it's, it's can really, I ask, can yes. I ask Natalie a question? Yes, please, absolutely. Okay, I'm fascinated because I feel like your work has always kind of like dabbled in or or, or had this. I, I hate the word theme, but there's always been this idea of like surveillance and being watched. Mm. Um, particularly given the the space that you're from the the border um El Paso Juarez um but it that seems to just like it, it that seems to be getting louder right in the newer work uh can you talk a little about that and then all and like I think a part of that too is the use of Sophia um <laughs> is like inextricable from surveillance oh it's fantastic isn't yeah it? Great question. Yeah. yeah, Natalie. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, for me, uh, it's been really heavy uh, on my mind. I think it's it's interesting that you say it's always been there. I have always felt like it's also been there in a way. I, I think that um, coming from El Paso Juarez, it's, it's so, you know, now we see a lot of the surveillance that I grew up with nationally in other places of the country. Right. Um, and so it's interesting seeing that. And I'm also, because of that, knowing that I'm very concerned about the amount and the kind of violent surveillance that we see happening on the border now, because I know from experience that, you know, I think it's uh, a real misconception if you think I mean, it's it's messed up, period, that people are OK with it happening on the border. Um, but it's also if you think it's not coming to your doorstep in the next decade, I think you're very mistaken um, and very naive. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Um, and so living now in other places in the country, you know, when I wrote uh, Lima Limon and the Virgin Cities, both of them, I really had not traveled very much. Um, I was very, I mean, I still consider myself a Southwest girl, but I really, um, you know, I just didn't have those opportunities really to travel um, and get to know the United States outside of my pocket. Um, and so Poetry allowed me the opportunity to live in a lot of different places um, and to travel a lot of different places in the country. And I'm always really interested in how um, I've seen right surveillance grow in that way. Um, and so, yes, it's definitely getting much louder in these, and uh, I think in these new poems, it's also, I think, getting louder because um, I've also had to deal a lot with what I consider to be like the, you know, the medical industrial complex in the last um, year and a half in a way that I um, hadn't, hadn't dealt with it before in my life um, on a more regular basis due to health issues. And so um, I'm really interested in also the, the surveillance and the control, um, of women's bodies. Right. Um, and so that's what I think the new work is sort of, um, trying to explore and delve in and it's, it's, um, so anyway, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah. 
Natalie, will we see um, Sophia come back or does she already come back in several other poems? Yeah, she comes back. She's sort of a a figure in these new poems um, because I find her, I find her and the responses to her um, fascinating. Um, And she is, even, you know, the, the way that people sort of diminish her and her demands um, is so telling, right, of the fact of her gender. Um, and yet I kind of also love Sophia, this like hairless robot, this hair, <laughs> she has no hair, which is the weirdest part of her, um, you know, and I'm also interested in like Saudi Arabia of all places, giving her citizenship, like that's so loaded. Um, And, you know, of course, I'm always interested in this new work, even with Sophia, right? And like notions of um, surveillance with regards to um, being seen as a citizen, which you're still surveilled, but in a different way, uh, and, and being seen as outside of that or being not worthy of that. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, like what are, what are the lines that we, that we draw as in group and out group? Um, and how does that affect the way that we surveil the violence is the same, um, rather the violence is not the same, but there's still violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That comes across really well, I think in your, in your, in your poems, um, and kind of related to this, I think I'd, I'd like to ask a question about voice. I'm wondering. Um, for both of you, how do you go about deciding and, and do you play with this, um, whether or not you're using the first person, second person, or third person in a poem, um, do you find yourselves on occasion writing a poem in one voice and then totally switching it around and, and, and going a different direction? Um, and as part of that, do you also find yourself in some poems, um, mixing, mixing them together? And if so, to what, to what effect, can you talk a little bit about, um, your use of voice in that way. Sure, I can start. This? Yeah, um, Matt, Natalie, please. Yeah. So I, uh, I generally draft a lot in first person. Um, uh, I'll be, I'll be real. I, I, I think I draft a lot in first person, and um, I, I think it's because I journal a lot, and so uh-huh. I'm always sort of writing in in the journals. Um, it's just sort of like in the immediacy of thought. Um, for some reason, first person for journaling to me makes sense to right. my brain. I don't know. Um, but it is an interesting question because it. W- I think it's a question that I then ask a lot of um, when I'm starting to see the poems come together as a book, right? Because to have an entire collection of just first person poems can be so claustrophobic to a reader um, and problematic, right? In a lot of ways. And so, um, you know, then it becomes a question at some point, usually before it's like a a book book, but once I have maybe like 30 poems or something like that, to really start asking myself, like, if, if there's too many first person poems, it sort of then becomes a question of like, well, where is the world in this? Why? Either we just in this one person's head. Um, so that's for me, but I think, you know, it depends on the project, right? Mm-hmm. Too a yeah. lot. I'm, I'm sure Eloisa has a very different answer because the project that she was working on is so different, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. You were writing so many persona poems there. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was actually so the reason I jumped into doing that, the the second project was that I was so sick of myself as the eye after. <laughs> the first collection uh, from the inside quietly that I just needed, if I was going to use an eye, it couldn't be me. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's interesting. uh, You know, and so when I, so Bobby had to be the eye because I was using his own quotes. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and then, um, you know, I actually, the, the Valerie poems were the most difficult and I probably rewrote all of those in some fashion, at least six or seven times. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and a lot of the shifts in that was from first to second to third person. Um, and, and at a certain point I decided that I couldn't be Valerie, that I didn't want to inhabit her as an I. Um, and, Uh, You know, but what's so interesting to me about that, if I can interrupt, 
is that, gosh, I mean, you feel like you are, you know, even though it's not written from the eye. It's yeah. so beautifully handled. It's very powerful the way that you that you did it. I, um, you don't have to be the eye to get that close. It's really remarkable how you've done it. Thank you. And I think that was was part of it is that the eye felt very false, but I did feel, but I still, you know, I I I think the Valerie poems are perhaps the most oh. intimate and the most uh me of them, but I still don't want to be her. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. and so now yeah, nine. Yeah. And so then the round poem, it kind of became this like, okay, well, we have the first person, Bobby third person's going to be Valerie. So then naturally the, the, the round poems, which is the narrator, I was like, okay, that can be a you. Um, and just, you know, I like compartmentalizing. So I was like, great. Now there's going to be no confusion uh, okay, between so that's the, 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 the people. <laughs> you carried that all the way through then yeah. for the whole book. Wow. Okay. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Okay. Um, I also love how both of you we've, um, you know, Spanish so seamlessly into your poems. Um, I mean, you know, Natalie, I um, I know just a little bit of Spanish, so I could follow some, but I, I think the way that you've done that is is really, um, it's really well done and it, it feels powerful. It feels so spot on. I'm wondering if that's something that you plan to do more of. How do you make the decision to to switch that line or, or maybe it's not, maybe it comes to you that way. I'm curious about that. When, um, when you find yourself using um, another language, is it because that's how it comes to you and you say, okay, I'm going to just go with that or what happens there? Yeah. I mean, um, so it's interesting with my first book, I only had, uh, I didn't have a ton of Spanish in, in the first book. Um, and I think it's because I had this a general rule in my head. I don't know where I came up with this rule, but that I, um, I didn't want to use Spanish unless I felt like it was something that couldn't be translated into English. Right. Like that somehow, right. It was magical. Like it couldn't, it, it needed to be that way. Um, and so it ended up resulting in like most of the poems, um, are very English centered. Um, I would say compared to Lima Limon, um, Lima Limon, on the other hand, I, decided to scrap that rule. I thought it was like, that's stupid. Um, (laughs) And I decided um, instead, I think to be much more organic and truthful to the way that I speak Spanglish, which is, um, it just sounded better to me musically, to my ear in one language over the other. That's the language the line was going in. Um, Mm -hmm. Because I wanted the entire focus of Lima Limon to be on the music of the language. Um, and that was what was going to propel the book. And so uh, I used that as sort of the rule to push it forward. Um, I think in this new work, there's a little bit less Spanish. I don't know if that will continue as I keep writing. Um but I also feel like I'm in a different place right now. Um, and it's a different project than Lima Limon was. And so yeah. I'm more interested in the, I didn't, not in the poems that I read today for you all, but in this new work, um, in kind of what does it mean to also use like, you know, governmental language, right? Like wow. how does it sound to use governmental language and to put on that, Mm-hmm. um that and keep with the that surveillance point. yeah yeah and so I'm I think that's where I'm at in this in this third project uh-huh okay interesting yeah and and Eloise I know that you do also a lot of translations so um I'm can do you mind talking a little bit about your use of both languages in your poems yeah I think in my own poems it comes down to you know, as Natalie was saying, the sound definitely, and also the uh, who's doing the speaking. So in my own work, um, if there's Spanish in it, it's either because I think like, because the intention, it's so weird. I, I'm, I don't know if Natalie could talk about this or wants to chime in, like intentionality and language are two things. Right. And so like, if I'm speaking, speaking to my mom in person, I'm going to speak in Spanish because my mom and I speak in Spanish together. Uh, And so if I'm speaking to my mom in a poem, if I switch it to English, that has to be intentional, right? Because that's Mm -hmm. not how I speak to my mother in person. And so then it becomes, does this feel honest? Mm -hmm. Um, 
And, and will a reader pick up on the honesty or the dishonesty, depending on which way I decide to, to move forward with it? Um, and so there, there's a little bit, I think, more intentionality um, with that uh, in my own work um, and, and wanting it to feel not only honest to, to like lived experience, but honest to the what, what having it in a specific language means to Mm -hmm. uh, the like emotional truth that mm -hmm. I'm trying to convey. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. Yeah. And then, I, I, yeah, no, no, go ahead, please. Oh, well, I was just gonna say, and in terms of translation, um, it's just really hard. Like I, I just had a friend text me today asking me to translate something for an anthology. And I was like, yes, of course. And now I'm like, Oh gosh, now I have to do this thing. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, in translating, there is so much that's, you know, the thing I hate to lose the most, but that is just a reality of the differences in language is music. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, as Natalie was saying, Lima Limon wanting the music to be a central part of that, the experience of that book uh, mm -hmm. meant like it was necessary to hold on to the Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that you just have to, kind of, you know, I personally have to get over when I'm translating because there's no way to keep the musicality of Spanish in English, which is mm -hmm. such a consonant, heavy language mm -hmm. compared to Spanish. It's, so it's different, but it is it is still, at least the poems of yours that I read that are, were in trans, you know, that where you were translating still sounded very musical. Yeah, you, you have to find other ways of creating yeah. music yeah. Uh, yeah. within it. It might be a different music. Yeah. Yes, that's what I meant. Yeah, exactly. But what I what I love about the poems that I've read from both of you, where you're doing that and and hearing them also, of course, aloud today, um, is that they give your poems another layer of texture, you know, and you and you do them so smoothly. And I, I just kind of feel like it's another portal into what you're doing when you when you just slip right into that other. Um, the other language. So it's, it's beautiful. So I, I wish we had more time. I'm afraid our time is up, but um, thank you both so much for being with us for the Dolly Poetry series. And, and also to all of you who've tuned in this evening, thank you. And um, please tell your, um, your friends to come back. Um, this program will stay up on our Dolly YouTube channel and um, um, please spread the word about these two terrific poets, Natalie and Alicia, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank All you. Right. Take care. All right. Good night. <laughs>